Welcome. Uh, my name is Victoria Herman. If you are just joining us, I am the Managing Director of the Arctic Institute, and I will be the moderator of this Breaking the Ice Ceiling webinar. And as a reminder, this is part of a series uh, throughout 2021, where we are featuring now over 30 incredible and women. Uh, my um, name is Victoria Herman. If you are, are just joining us, I am to, the Managing Director of the Arctic uh, Institute, and I will be the moderator of this. We are going to get started here, um, but before we do, I just want to give a few quick house rules. If you have any questions, uh, you can put them in the chat throughout our two presenters. I will be moderating that chat box and we will be moving into what I hope is a lively question and answer after both of our speakers. So if you are listening to those presentations and you have a question you don't want to forget, please type that out in the chat box so we can capture it. We will hear from two speakers first before moving into that discussion. And this is being recorded. So if you have to leave early, you can always catch the recording afterwards. That is more than enough from me. So I am going to introduce our first incredible speaker, Dr. Joanna Kafarowski. Uh, Dr. Kafarowski is a Canadian independent scholar who has worked extensively with indigenous women in the Arctic around natural resource management issues and has participated in a last degree North Polar Expedition. She is the author of the first comprehensive biography of the female polar explorer, Louise Arner Boyd, who uh, we are going to hear more about today. Um, and that incredible book, which I highly encourage everyone to please, please read, um, is The Polar Adventures of a Rich American Dame, A Life of Louise Arner Boyd. Um, and that was published in 2017. I am now going to to hand over my virtual mic to Dr. Kafarowski uh, to take our stage. All right, Dr. Kafarowski, you have the floor. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Herman. Uh, can you see my screen right now? Uh, not okay. yet. There we go. I'll just take a moment to share my screen with you. And there we go. So first of all, I would like to thank Dr. Herman and the Arctic Institute so much for hosting me and for organizing this phenomenal webinar focusing on uh, women in, in the polar regions. Uh, I would also like to first uh, acknowledge that I am living and working in the unceded territory of the Coast Salish peoples, specifically the Lekwungen and Wasinich First Nations. And now to Louise Arner Boyd, my favorite topic. I, I'm absolutely thrilled to have any opportunity to speak about uh, Louise Arner Boyd and, and to share her story with you. So to begin, she was born in 1887 in California, and she was the daughter of Louise Cook Arner from Rochester, New York, a very well-off family. Her father was John Franklin Boyd, who was a uh, who started out as a, a farm boy in Valley Forge, Pennsylvania. He decided to leave home and, and seek his fortune traveling across the American West, uh, working as a miner, and ended up in Virginia City, Nevada, where he met with the Cook brothers. They joined forces and uh, traveled, continued traveling, ended up in uh, California. And there they were presented with a unique opportunity, which was to uh, purchase a mine, Bodie Mine, which at that time uh, had been very low producing, had been passed over by other mining engineers. So after uh, a few sleepless nights and, and a few bottles, they decided to take this tremendous risk. They purchased Bodie Mine, 
And it was a rags to riches stories story. Practically overnight, the, they struck it rich. Gold was discovered in Bodhi mine and they became millionaires. So what you see in this image on the screen is what is now Bodhi State Park. It's, uh, as you can see, it's a very evocative landscape and, and quite wonderful for a, a biographer such as myself to, uh, to be uh, working in. So after making their, their millions, they moved to San Francisco and uh, John Franklin Boyd actually married the uh, niece of his business partners and they bought a piece of land in San Rafael, just outside of San Francisco, and started up his family. So here you see the, our, our protagonist, Louise Arner Boyd, as a, a young girl on the, on the far left of your screen with her mother and her two older brothers. She had an idyllic childhood. Uh, growing up with, with the two older boys, they hiked, they fished, they hunted. Uh, not only in the land behind their family mansion, Maple Lawn, but also in the ranch that the family owned outside of what is now Diablo in California. She was also uh, an avid reader and particularly enjoyed stories about polar exploration, uh, really loved reading about American explorers such as George Washington DeLong and the Jeanette Expedition. Uh, the grisly tale of, of the uh, Greeley expedition, and she longed to see the ice and the snow. Of course, living in California, that didn't happen very often. So she grew to adulthood and was uh, not only had this part of her life in which she, she was drawn so much to the natural world, but she was also raised to be a society woman uh, the only daughter of the family, she was uh, regularly attended various parties and, and galas and, and, and society events with her mother. And so grew to adulthood as a, as a very secure and, and happy woman. Uh, uh, sadly, by the time she had uh, completely grown up, she was fully mature um, when she was 32. Both her parents died very tragically within a short period of time of each other. Her two brothers had also passed away. And at the age of 32, she found herself uh, completely alone. No family, no close family. Uh, she was unmarried, no children. So she had uh, no family, but she was a multimillionaire. After a, a period of mourning, after the death of her parents, she decided to really explore her, her desire to go north and to see the ice and the snow. So she hired a, a ship, she brought some friends along, they traveled to Europe, went to Norway and uh, hired this ship to go north. So she encountered pack ice for the first time when she was 32 and it was a riveting experience. She just was, was uh, awestruck. It was a short trip. She returned back to California and entered her, her life as a socialite, but there was, something, there was something stirring within her. She carried on their normal life and, and received an invitation that was uh, hard to refuse, and that was to uh, return to Europe to go back to England and to be presented at Buckingham Palace uh, to their majesties George V and Queen Mary. And this image here shows Miss Boyd in her court finery looking, looking quite splendid. She returned to California and found herself thinking more and more about uh, her, her travel to Norway, to the Arctic Ocean, and decided that, that she had to really look into this deeper. And so this map showing, uh, as you can see, uh, primarily Scandinavia, the circumpolar region, this area particularly uh, in northern Norway, in Greenland, Svalbard, Franz Josef Land, was to be the focus of her attention for uh, many years. 
So again, after returning in, in 1925, late 1925 to California, decided the next year to return to the North. And she decided to uh, hire a, a, a particular vessel, which is a very well-known maritime vessel. Uh, and it was the hobby. It had a very, very uh, particular uh, association with polar history already because it had been the base ship the previous year when World Amundsen had uh, launched his bid to uh, fly to the North Pole. So Louise Boyd was, was absolutely delighted to, to hire this ship. Uh, she provisioned it and they, she decided after conducting a, um, a great deal of research that she would be traveling um, not only to the Arctic region, but to go very specifically to Franz Josef Land. Now, uh, for, for many of you who are aware, Franz Josef Land is, is even now very difficult to, to reach. Uh, often has treacherous ice conditions, uh, very, very unpredictable weather. But at that particular time, it was extremely remote and also very hazardous for a particular reason. And this was that only a few years previously, Russia had claimed ownership of Franz Josef Land. And of course, still at that time, Russia was experiencing uh, a lot of um, upheaval and, and tumult. So you can imagine um, you know, what the feeling was with Miss Boyd and their crew when the hobby traveled to Franz Josef Land. So this was a Norwegian ship flying the Norwegian flag as well as the American Stars and Stripes and traveling to a region that was claimed by Russia. So the potential for, uh, for, for difficulty and hazards was extremely high, but this did not stop Ms. Boyd. And even though it was a, um, uh, you know, going to this, this uh, inhospitable area, Louise Arner Boyd always traveled in style. So of course she would have all the necessary equipment uh, and safety measures were taken, but uh, also amongst the packing list for this trip, we see that she had uh, 20 cases of, of uh, claret, uh, wines, fine wines, brandy, beer. And this was uh, unfortunately not shared with the crew. This was only for Miss Boyd herself and her three guests. So she was going to be doing something serious, but by God, she was gonna have a good time doing it. After the, this 26 uh, voyage, which was primarily a hunting trip, uh, she returned to uh, Europe. And here you see a, an image, an early image of her with her longtime uh, chauffeur, uh, Percy Cameron. This is one of my, my favorite pictures of Miss Boyd, you know, looking so resolute and stalwart while being very stylish at the same time. So she returned home after the, the, this 26 uh, um, expedition or, or, or tourist trip essentially, and returned to California where she developed the photographs she had taken and had, um, uh, continued to do her reading and her research. She had a, a very extensive library in her mansion and decided uh, that, you know, something, it, it, something inside of her wasn't going away. She continued to be very unsettled, unsure about what, uh, what her life ahead would, would, would be like. And so uh, decided essentially that she was going to launch an even more ambitious, ambitious trip. She again hired the hobby, uh, contacted Captain Olson, her, her previous captain, and flew in the summer of 1928 to Norway, fully prepared to engage on, uh, on another uh, voyage to the Arctic. When she arrived, she discovered to her horror that her, uh, one of her, uh, I, her, her idols, uh, the iconic Norwegian explorer Roald Amundsen had gone missing uh, and he had himself um, 
had flown in the airplane, the Latham, in a quest to find another explorer who had gone missing. So, so Miss Boyd arrived in Norway, learned this terrible news and was faced with a choice. Should she go forward on her own trip or was there another option? After a, a short period of, of reflection, she actually approached the Norwegian government with an audacious plan. And that was that she would put the hobby the crew, the provisions fully at the, um, at the behest of the uh, Norwegian government uh, allowed them to use it completely. But there was one catch. And that catch was that Miss Boyd herself had to go along too. This was an incredibly uh, bold uh, uh, request that she made because of course going north at this time in the 1920s whether it was a, a, a pleasure cruise or a tourist cruise uh, would be one thing, but going and taking part on a rescue mission would be very, very dangerous indeed. The focus of that trip was of course on finding the missing explorer and his crew. Would, there would be no concern about the uh, safety or the um, you know, the well-being, the pleasure of the guests. So she was just being incredibly courageous in, in this offer. Of course, the Norwegian government could hardly refuse. They accepted her offer and Miss Boyd uh, joined the international rescue mission to find Roald Amundsen. Of course, as you can imagine, she was uh, not well accepted. There were a number of other European nations taking part in this rescue mission, many famous explorers, um, other very high ranking military men who were taking part and they were highly skeptical of Miss Boyd's participation. And you have to also keep in mind that she was not a passive uh, guest or observer. She was taking part as a co-leader. This map you see is actually the, the specific route map undertaken by the hobby. It was the actual route that uh, her ship followed. And uh, as you can see, it was very detailed, um, was, was, was going back continually, very carefully searching for any sign of the Latham. Uh, tragically, uh, as we know, um, Amundsen was never found and by the end of the summer of 1928 the rescue mission was was called off. By, by that time uh, Louise Arner Boyd had won the complete respect of all who took part in this mission. She had been given many opportunities throughout that summer to withdraw uh, but instead she uh, urged the captain to go further, to spend longer in the field, uh, to, to do anything to, to find Amundsen. So by the end of that summer, although she was just preparing to, to return to California as a, a regular individual, she was um, shocked and, and delighted to learn that the Norwegian government had granted her the Order of St. Olaf uh, as well, the French government, um, because uh, the uh, co-pilot of the Latham had been French, the French government also uh, honored Miss Boyd with the uh, National uh, Legion of Honor medal. And you see here Miss Boyd very proudly wearing this medal, uh, these medals on her dress. And here we see Maple Lawn. It's a contemporary picture of the uh, her mansion that she lived in all her life. So when she returned uh, home to California at the in the fall of 1928, we find that she has, her life has been uh, completely upended by this mission. She, she at this point, we, we learn that uh, she has decided that the trajectory of her life has been completely altered by her participation in this expedition. She was going to uh, focus on scientific expeditions in the Arctic from this time forward. And so uh, commits to this uh, after she returns from, from the Amundsen um, mission. 
also from this point forward, we see um, Miss Boyd really living a, a double life. On one hand, when she is in California and the United States, she continues taking part as a very active philanthropist uh, and society woman and uh, conducts um, various lectures while she's there. But while she is in the United States, she is a she is known as a socialite. That, that is her, her, her reputation, her image. But when she leaves the United States, when she returns to the Arctic, she fully engages again as an Arctic explorer. She has won the respect of her peers. Uh, she is very well known. And, uh, and, and so we find from then on, she has to balance these two aspects, this double life. And, and it is something which is a struggle for her uh, uh, for the rest of her life. This map here shows, uh, again, a very specific region uh, focusing on, on Greenland and Svalbard, uh, Yen Mayan land. And this would be, this particular region would be the focus of her uh, future expeditions. So in the 1930s, uh, Louise Arner Boyd actually organized, financed, and participated in four expeditions. 1931, 1933, 37, and 38. And these were completely focused on uh, science. Uh, there was no longer the, uh, the work that she had done in the previous, uh, um, her previous trips there where they were pleasure cruises or hunting cruises. These were entirely focused on science. So even though she did not have advanced education herself, she had left school when she was in her late teens. She was very uh, adept at locating individuals who could help her and, and help uh, accomplish the objectives of each expedition. She secured the support of the American Geographical Society and so each expedition was focused on uh, various branches of science and she located and hired scientists who were geomorphologists, oceanographers, uh, botanists, geologists. And uh, for these, these four expeditions, um, she was very uh, clear in her focus about identifying the objectives for, for each of the expeditions. This is the Veslakari, another well-known Norwegian uh, vessel. And uh, it was the second of three ships that she sailed on in her life uh, as, a, as an, uh, an explorer. And she really had a, almost an emotional attachment to her ship. So the first ship, the hobby, was um, uh, continued to be important for, uh, for, for really presenting her uh, her life as an early explorer, but the Veslakari was, was really extra special. And she, even after she uh, had completed her expeditions, she remained in contact and assisted the captain and, and many of the members of the crew. Many of the scientists uh, working with her completely underestimated her and underestimated her abilities. So even though she was not did not have her doctorate, um, did not have her master's or, or any university degree whatsoever. She was entirely self-schooled, but she had um, was was very uh, was very energetic in the field. The scientists would regularly complain that she would have them up first thing in the morning, would keep them out in the field, and that they would not be able to return to the ship until very late at night. So this image here is, is just a, a, a photo of Miss Boyd returning to the ship, uh, but she was very active, not only as the leader of the expedition, but she was also in most of the expeditions, she was the chief botanist and always acted as the chief photographer because this was a, a real love of hers. Here we see Miss Boyd making that transition back to California. So if you had seen this photograph or seen this woman on, on the ship returning from Europe to the United States, 
you would hardly believe that she was a, a rough and rugged uh, Ant Arctic explorer. <clears throat> Excuse me. During this decade, the 1930s, was a time where not only is she fully engaged as her life um, as an explorer, but also she won the respect of, uh, continued to win the respect of her peers. Her, her contributions were covered extensively in the newspapers. She wrote three books during this period, and she also won several awards. So this is the Cullum Medal that uh, was awarded to Miss Boyd in 1937 by the American Geographical Society. And she was only the second woman to win this medal. And now even in 2021, only three women have won it. So we still have a ways to go. Another honor that she was granted is that she was asked to sign the uh, Flyers and Explorers Globe, which is the, a precious artifact held by the American Geographical Society. And it was signed by all the major explorers and aviators from the 20th century. So you can see by the delighted smile on her face, um, just how, how she felt about that. When she returned to California, it was now uh, the Second World War had begun. Her own plans had to be adjusted somewhat. Uh, she didn't expect to be going on an expedition. And yet she was approached by the head of the uh, National Bureau of Standards, a government department, because they were uh, well aware of her uh, work in Greenland and her, her um, the fact that she was a polar specialist. And so she was actually asked to return to Greenland and to conduct a covert mission for the United States government. Uh, she was tasked with uh, locating um, potential uh, landing sites for the military, as well as uh, conducting experiments and gathering data regarding radio transmission in this polar region. So this objective was actually hidden from her uh, captain and uh, everyone who was taking part in the mission. The map that you see here is the route taken uh, by her ship on this 1941 expedition. Uh, it was an area that she was unfamiliar with. Uh, as you can see, she traveled to Western Greenland and the Canadian Arctic. And so, um, Again, to keep in mind that this was 1941, this was an active war zone. And um, so again, Miss um, Boyd showed her, her true metal. This is the, the uh, Morrissey. This was the third vessel on which Miss um, Boyd traveled as a, an Arctic explorer. It was again, another a vessel with a, uh, a stellar um, history. Uh, captained by Robert Bartlett, who you see there um, on the deck. It was uh, a Newfoundland vessel. She was most disappointed that she could not secure the Veslikari or the hobby, um, but uh, accepted that she would be working with Captain Bartlett, who was himself very well known because he had been uh, responsible for working with Peary uh, and taking him part way on Peary's um, quest to claim the North Pole. And even though Miss Boyd and Bartlett had worked together um, in the United States, uh, and it was felt that they would get along quite well, in fact, nothing could be further than the truth. Uh, Miss Boyd documents very clearly that, uh, in fact, she, she noticed that, that people were, were treating her differently from, from on her previous trips. And in one of the diaries of the scientists, they, they note that, in fact, Cap Captain Bartlett spent most of the time trying to hide from uh, Miss Boyd on the trip, which, as you can imagine, in a ship of this size would be difficult to do. So there was a lot of uh, personal animosity between the two, but it was highly successful from a, a scientific perspective. 
After 1941, uh, Miss Boyd returned again to the United States. This would be her last expedition, uh, but she was still highly in demand by the United States government. She was hired as a military consultant during the war and uh, many uh, officials traveled to her mansion in order to um, seek her advice. Uh, they brought many of her maps and reports, photographs and films. And she was uh, very active still from that point forward um, in various polar organizations. She was a very proud and keen member of the Society of Women Geographers, uh, an organization of which I'm very proud to be a member. And she also was uh, acted as a, uh, the first woman counselor for the American Geographical Society. She also was a, um, a board member, a very active board member with the American Polar Society. So even though she was um, uh, more mature in age, she continued to be very involved in polar organizations, in uh, writing her books and, uh, and lecturing. But there was one, one goal she had not been uh, successful in accomplishing, and that was she really, really wanted to go to the North Pole. So in 1955, she convinced some of her, uh, her, her high-ranking uh, friends and colleagues to hire a plane, and she was actually the first woman to be flown over the North Pole in a non-military capacity. So you can see uh, Miss Boyd here returning and being very, very pleased to have accomplished her goal. In her latter years, uh, she did suffer ill health, but more importantly, she had encountered financial difficulties very tragically. And in fact, by the end of her life, she was completely bankrupt. She had to be financially supported by her many friends and had given everything she had, her whole fortune, her vast fortune had been given in the cause of, of science and of polar exploration. So Miss Boyd passed away in 1972. And this is one of my favorite pictures of her. Um, you can see again, she is uh, very, uh, very well dressed with her jewelry, her hat, uh, her, her scarf, but she was in the uh, natural world that she loved. And, you know, she has her skirt hiked up. She didn't give a damn of what anyone thought, but just was going to uh, follow her dream and, and, uh, and stroll off in, into the distance. So that ends my presentation. Um, as uh, Dr. Herman said, my research ended up in, in her biography. And, and even though that was published in uh, 2017, my, my journey with, with Miss Boyd continues because I, I still do research on her. Uh, she led me on to uh, one, of, uh, one of her friends uh, whose life I've, I've just finished exploring as well, uh, another polar explorer from Antarctica, Jackie Ronnie. So I, I counted a privilege to have uh, shared some of my life with, um, with this remarkable story. So thank you so much. Thank you. And if everyone could please join me in giving a huge, huge virtual round of applause. I am already seeing some really great responses and questions in our chat. Thank you so much for that incredible presentation. And I loved all of the visuals that you really brought to life this important woman. Um, I'm going to ask that we hold our questions till the end where we are going to bring both of our speakers back onto our virtual stage and have a robust conversation about both of their presentations. As a reminder, if you have questions, please put them in the chat so that we can get to them in that Q&A. Now we are going to switch to our second incredible presenter today. And I am going to very shortly hand over my virtual microphone to our second speaker, 
Anna Seliverstova, who is a master's student at Masaryk University uh, studying conflict and democracy studies. Her research interests are in youth cooperation, youth policy, gender, health, and wellness in the high north. Today, she is going to be presenting women's participation in Russia's Arctic exploration in the 1910s to 1930s, where she will define the role of women in the development of the Arctic by Russia in that time period. I am going to ask her to come onto our virtual stage um, and uh, I will hand over my virtual microphone to you. Uh, again, if you have questions, please put those in the chat box throughout the presentation. Anna? Yeah, can, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, now I share my screen. Um, Okay, just a second. So yeah. Um, so I'll skip the first part because we already said about this research. And I want to start with the 18th century. Uh, in the 18th century, when the first woman went to the Arctic expedition, it was not allowed for women to go there. Wives were obliged to wait for their husbands at home in or in the northern towns. Their participation in expeditions were considered unacceptable behavior, which can be quite dangerous to their health. It is what is largely defined by the position of women in society, the inability of women to get an education, as well as the harsh conditions of the Arctic. Also, a certain role was played by the fact that the development of the Arctic during this period was irregular and spontaneous. Despite the fact that the government recognized the importance of the northern sea roads and the resources of the foreigners, the unsuccessful practice of expedition determined the negative attitude of the Russian government to further research in this area. At the same time, state authorities strongly encouraged merchants to equip campaigns for their own money. The first woman in the Arctic was Tatiana, Tatiana Pontesheva. She was a member of the crew of the third unit of Great Northern Expedition, which was directed by her husband, Vasily Pontesheva. In honor of his wife, he named a bay on the eastern Tamir coast in the Laptev Sea. The true motives of Tatiana's participation in the expedition are unknown, but most likely it was due to the poor financial situation in the family. They were robbed by the servant and the couple lost all their money and wealth. As a result, Vasily was not able to provide Tatiana's accommodation in Siberia. During the wintering, Tatiana immediately found a common ground with the indigenous people and helped to establish mutual cooperation between them and team members. For years, expedition carried out work on refining the map of the Lena River Delta, worked on the repairing and preparation of the vessel for further navigation. Tatiana tried to help as much as she could. In addition to general housework, she was involved in the ship -wide activities, helped the doctor in the treatment of scurvy patients. The rumor about the amazing Russian woman quickly spread around the surrounding area and the Yakuts and Nomans from distance camp came, began to come to the winterers for whom Pronchisheva always had a good word and good advice. After the death of her husband, Tatiana continued to work on an equal basis with other participants and help patients. Her care, firmness and courage gave strength to other team members. She died in 1736 and was buried next to her husband at the mouth of the Alimak River. At the beginning of the 20th century, the development of Northern Sea Road became one of the main economic and military strategic tasks for the Russian Empire. Further, the development of agriculture in Siberia required the search for new roads for the export of grain to the world market. Secondly, the natural resources of the Arctic island made it necessary to organize their protection and geological study. Third, the development of technology, radio communications, advanced steamships, icebreakers made it possible to promote expeditions. Actually, at this time, the way to women into the Arctic was open. This was largely facilitated by the development of the Russian women movement and changes in the position of women in the Russian society in the second half of 19th century. 
In addition to the ideas of philosophers, the ideological recognition of feminism and emancipation in Russia were the courage of Decembrists, wives who followed their husbands to Siberia, the liberal reforms of the Alexander II, and romantic literature, which with its, with its ideals of free secular women. Uh, girls uh, sued to get an education and profession, throwing off the stereotype of big and nervous ladies. The formation of women educational institutions also contributed to the liberation of women in the 16th and 17th. The first Marinsky women's gymnasiums were open and higher women's courses were established to help expand the scope of women's professional activities. It was also popular among women to join the Russian Red Cross Society and take short-term courses that trained nurses. For a long time, these courses were the main organization where Russian women were able to get a higher medical education. Russian Red Cross Society played a significant role in the development of the women movement and the formation of a new type of woman with a high level of personal and social self-awareness. Such a woman was Yerminia Zdanka. She, she participated in the Brusilov expedition. Yerminia was a gentle, delicate, but at the same time independent and decisive person. She graduated from medical school and wished to go to the Balkan War. The formation of Yerminia's personality was greatly influenced by her family. Her aunt, Anna Ivrinova, was the first woman in Russia who received a doctoral degree in law. It is also worth noting that Yerminia was a relative of Brusilov. His sister, Ksenia, was married to Yerminia's uncle. Actually, he, in July 1912, invited Yerminia to take part in the expedition. Initially, Yerminia was involved in the expedition to Alexandrovsk, the purpose of which was hunting. However, when the ship arrived in Alexandrovsk, Brusilov faced difficulties in organizing the further way of the expedition. Several crew members left, some did not come at the appointed time. The expedition stayed without a doctor and was on the verge of failure. Yerminia was worried about it and, as well as she had medical education, considered it her duty to stay and replace the doctor. After lying to Brusilo that she obtained the per parents' permission to continue the expedition, Yerminia hit the road. Moreover, she also financially supported the expedition, giving Brusilo 200 rubles to buy provisions in Alexandrovsk. Yerminia Zdanka worked on the vessel as a doctor, nurse and photographer. Also, she was responsible for food and cooking. Beside the official duties, Yerminia brought psychological comfort to the team. Albanov, the crew member, wrote about Yerminia in his memories, calling her our young lady. She was the single mistress of the vessel and the soul of the entire crew. He also noted that Zdanka never expressed regrets that she got involved with Vasilov in the expedition. When we joked about this, she was seriously angry. Next woman of this time is Julia John Cicin, who participated in the Rosanov expedition. Much of Jewish biography is unknown to us. It is known that she came from Paris, had an intelligent family, got a good home education, and was a graduate of the Sorbonne with quite non-female profession of the geologist. At the university, John Cicin met with Zimmer Rosanov. In his letters to his mother, Rosanov wrote, her knowledge is highly necessary for me. I would not be able to do what I can do easily do now, working together. The scientific importance of our union is invaluable and enormous. I will be happy with such a wife. Vladimir named Glacier and Bay on the west coast of Nova Zemlya after Juliet. There is no common opinion why Juliet went to Svalbard. Some scholars argue that Rusanov did not plan to take Juliet on board, since he, having been in the harsh condition of the Arctic, and he knew that for women, such environment is associated with a great risk. Another claims that Julie did not want to left Rusanov and convinced him to take her on the expedition. Rusanov did not object, and they went on pre-wedding journey. Juliet was accepted into the crew as a medic and naturalist. Given that Juliet was a geologist, it is likely that she was involved in the collection and processing of data in the study of Svalbard. For example, Rusanov visited the coal mines of an English company on the north shore of King Bay with Juliet. In addition, in addition Rusanov expedition collected paleontological and botanical collections, which no doubt can be interesting to Juliet. And soon the scientific work in this area was fully occupied by her. 
However, only in the Soviet era, women in the Arctic will stop being rare, exceptional phenomenon and will become an equal member of the expeditions. Several factors contributed to this. First, from the very beginning, Bolsheviks have identified that Arctic as a identified the Arctic as a priority area. The Arctic was considered as an area of strategic and geopolitical interest, vital for the territory integrity of the country. In addition, these lands attracted the government by natural resources, which were necessary for economic development. In 1918, Lenin signed a decree on the organization of hydrographic expedition to the seas of the Arctic Ocean, as well as decree on the allocation of 3 million rubles for the study of the Arctic Ocean. The new plan of the Arctic development had a systemic, complex approach to the region. Research should be carried out with the help of icebreakers and aircrafts, as well as an extensive network of hydrometeorological stations and research bases, managed by central government organization that also provides fundings. In 1920 was established the Northern Scientific and Fishing Expedition. In 1921 was established Floating Marine Scientific Institute, Plav Marine, which should explore the Arctic Ocean and neighboring coasts of Soviet Russia in Europe and Asia. The main result of Plav Marine's activity is the construction, equipment, and dispatch of the first northern vessel, Perseus, on which was conducted more than 80 research expeditions. Geologists Tatiana Garshkova and Maria Klonova devoted their lives to the Perseus expeditions. During the 1920s was founded the first industrial centers on the territory of the Arctic Ocean coast. Trial mining of coal and oil was launched, the timber industry emerged, and the Igarka River and seaport were developed. In 1923, the first Soviet polar station was built with a powerful geophysical laboratory in Matachkenshar on Nova Zemlya. In 1929, one of the most important polar stations on Franz Josef Land appeared. In the 13th, development of the Arctic increased. This was facilitated by the beginning of the first five-year plan, which included the task of building socialism in the Far North. The office responsible for, sol for solving northern issues was the main directorate of the Northern Sea Road, Glavsev-Sevmorput. The first head of Glavsev-Sevmorput was the polar explorer Schmidt. In the 13th, dozens of scientific expeditions were sent to the northern latitude. It was stated that it is necessary to move from individual measures to a systemic and comprehensive, prolonged and, and extensive study and industrial development of the polar region of the Soviet Union. The number of polar stations significantly increased. An equally important role was played by the Bolshevik policy towards women. The unity of the interest of the party and women is clearly expressed in the work of Armand and Kalantine. For example, Kalantine noted that losing the role of the producer of goods in the economy is the main reason for women's deprivation. Kalantine believed that a woman can endure any work, even physically hard. In the 1930s, the Soviet Union started a period of mobilization of women as a labor force. At this time, the so-called new Soviet gender was created. During this period, previously impossible strategies of behavior were developed both for women and men, who achieved their professional goals within the framework of socialism. Women actively participated in social movements, successfully achieved traditionally male professions, uh, one of which was the winter polar explorer. The myth that the Arctic is only suitable for men has been broken. The women demonstrated they have they would be able to cope with the harsh climatic conditions and heavy physical exertion. It would be wrong to say that everyone agreed with these changes. There were opinions that there are no conditions for women in the Arctic, that they are slowed down normal work. They said that undesirable atmosphere of flirting and gossip will develop wrong them, which can end very badly. However, Schmidt always welcomed the appearance of women among the scientific staff. Schmidt wrote, as a matter of principle, I consider it quite acceptable for women to participate in expeditions. The women worked perfectly. Moreover, the participation of women in the expeditions was also encouraged at the highest level. The Soviet Union developed family wintering system. Living and working conditions were guaranteed. The first type of woman in the Arctic is still the wives of polar explorers. Women who went with their husbands to Wintering found something to do both for their professional development and for the common good. 
It's also very important that they brought hospitality and cousinness to the reality of wintering and definitely helped to improve the emotional background of the team. Wives went with their husbands to the northern regions when the station were not yet equipped and it was necessary to raise the economy from the beginning. For example, Zinaida Ushakova went, to the, went on the team of her husband, Georgi Ushakov, in 1926 to Rogers Bay. Of course, uh, Zinaida was primarily engaged in household work, cooking, laundry, and cleaning. However, after finishing these duties, she helped her husband in scientific activities. She worked with the photographs, put their barium in order, and prepared stuffed birds. In addition, Zinaida played a positive role in introducing the culture and hygiene to indigenous people. She noted in her diary, I had to teach them to wash with water, comb their hair, and wear a dress. Some of them didn't even know about bread. I should have taught them how to bake bread. Sometimes coming to the Arctic uh, simply in the status of wife, women gained new professional skills already there. Uh, for example, non Haritonova. At first she was a cook, but over time her duties expanded. She learned how to conduct weather observations and often helped her husband. In the evenings, she sat at the radio station mastering the profession of the radio operator. The wives of the polar explorers gave a lot to the public life at the polar stations. They conducted library work, took part in the publications of wall newspapers, led foreign language courses, as well as educational groups. The second type of woman in the Arctic is woman specialists, meteorologists, radio engineers, hydrologists, geologists, and etc. Officially, the first Soviet woman who joined the Arctic wintering as a specialist was Nina Demia. She specialized in marine fishing and geology, participated in the Schmidt expedition, and also uh, she was the first woman in charge of the winter camp on the Mashni Island. Nina showed and proved to the Soviet Union and the world that women could bring great scientific benefit by working in the Arctic. Nina did not saw her scientific work without expeditions. She was guided by professional interest and the desire to contribute to the construction of socialism. During the wintering, she conducted observations of the flora and fauna of the Arctic deserts. Nina put forward the idea of creating a woman wintering camp, but Schmidt rejected her proposal. Another part of the woman's history in the Arctic dedicated to women heads of polar cities. One of these women was Valentina Stromova. With the appearance of Valentina Onegarka, the port literally changed. In the mid-30s, under her administration, were built new two-story accommodations and clubs, streets and the whole territory of the town were improved. Her merits were highly appreciated by Schmidt. He said, five years ago, here on Agarka was nothing but tundra. Today, it's a prosperous port and it's run by a woman. Astrumova became a woman of her time, distinguished by high work capacity and enthusiasm. Unfortunately, in 1937, Valentina was charged with anti-Soviet activities and sentences to death. Among women specialists, teachers also made a huge contribution to the development of the Arctic. The main task of the teachers was to teach the indigenous people of the North who often resisted this. The language barrier was also a serious issue. For instance, Ekaterina Rupsova, who came to Chukotka, didn't speak the Eskimo language, and her Eskimo students didn't speak Russian. She had to learn herself and teach others at the same time. This invaluable experience was the basis of a number of her works on folklore and linguistic. As for work of women doctors in the Arctic, it became possible only from the beginning of the 30s, when the first hospitals were opened there. The biggest challenge faced by doctors in the Arctic was the shamanism of the indigenous people. They did not trust doctors and were afraid of medicine. Only over time, the local population starts to trust evidence-based medicine. Later, at the hospitals were opened nursing courses for indigenous women. The contribution of women to the creation of the Arctic Museum is also important. Among founders of the museum, along with famous polar explorers, were also women, meteorologist Zinaida Malinovska, geologist Anna Kustisova, geobotanist Zoya Savkina. All three of them not only had an excellent education and were highly qualified employees, but also participated in expeditions. They were in, involved in collecting materials for exhibitions and prepared the museum for the opening. 
one of the events that probably finally put an end to the measure of whether women can fully participate in polar expeditions or not was the tragedy on the Chelyuskin. The experience of surviving on, on an ice floor in harsh conditions demonstrated the strength and courage not only of women but of men. On the Chelyuskin were 10 women uh, among staff Alexandra Gorskaya, Yelena Burkova, Tatiana Miroslavskaya, and Anna Rudas. Uh, among scientists um, Anna Sushkina, Olga Komova, and Praskeva Labza. And also there were three wives of polar explorers Zinaida Ritsk, Dorotea Vasilieva, and Luisa Boyko. Also, there were two kids. The Schmidt Ice Camp lasted for two months from February 13 to April 13. Before the Chelyuskin sank, the participants managed to pack everything required for the camp. Schmidt later admired the reaction of women on crash. When the ice clamped down on the ship, we thought the women would scream, but none of them showed their fear. They helped the crew member down, down to ice. The women collected everything necessary for the survival of 103 people. In addition to childcare and cooking, women maintained comfort and order in the camp, knocking and knocking out and drying bags, washing clothes. Men tried not to allow women to, to do hard work. However, Anna Sushkina, for example, along with the men went to the airfield and spent hours hammering the ice. The main occupation of women was sewing mittens, necessary for work in the cold. The women also monitored the hygiene of all people of the camp. Women specialists continued to conduct research activities. Komova's meteorological observations were vital to the expedition. They helped predict the way of the ice floor and also determine the program of the rescue operation. Women and children softened the psychological situation in the camp. The men kept themselves in hand, did not show their anxiety, and refrained from cursing. It is worth noting that a significant role in the rescue operation was played by radio operator Ludmila Schrader. She was the first to establish a connection with the radio station on the Schmidt camp. To sum up, um, the first woman went to Arctic because of various circumstances. It's worth mentioning that their motivation was romantic. They idolized their upcoming journey and didn't know what severe reality awaits them. In the Soviet era in the 20s and 30s, the number of women and their role in the development of the Arctic significantly increased. A new type of woman of the revolutionary era is being formed. We can see a transformation of the masculinity structure of the polar, exp polar explorer profession. Women try to work on a regular basis with men, proving that they are equally colleagues. The enthusiasm of the researchers is also associated with the thoughts of environmental involvement in uh, building of socialism, a phenomenon of Soviet era. The first polar explorers provided proof that the way of, to the Arctic is also open to women. Thank you so, so much. And again, if everyone could give a huge round of applause for the incredible presentation that we just listened to of so many women. Uh, I was pretty blown away by just how many you were presenting their stories, their contribution. Um, and I think a really fantastic parallel to our first speaker. We have about 25 minutes uh, to uh, our question and answer session. And we already have a few question and answers that have come in. Again, if you have a question, please type that into the chat for either of our speakers and we will moderate them now. I am going to ask our first a uh, participant who has a question, Stephanie, if you could come on and ask your question. Hi, yes, thank you so much. Um, I was just asked, wanted to ask Joanna, in the American PBS series, Unladylike, I assume you've seen or contributed to the essay or the, the episode on Miss Boyd. Yes. They talk about her witnessing Amundsen arrive in San Francisco when she was young. And that's the only reference I had ever seen to that. Can you speak to that and if it's true or, or documented? And my second question is, can you talk about as we measure climate change, 
are her photos relevant today to the studies that we're doing on differences over the last century? Well, thank you, Stephanie, for, for your questions. Both of them excellent questions. Uh, for, to, to speak to your first one, um, from my perspective, that's speculation. Uh, we know that uh, Amundsen did travel to San Francisco in, in 1906 uh, on the Joy, um, and that was following the earthquake that had happened in San Francisco in, in April of that year. Um, so we know that, that Amundsen was in San Francisco. We know that Miss Boyd was in uh, California at that time with her family because she had returned from Europe with her parents uh, to travel back to San Rafael because of uh, you know, what, what damage had occurred there and they were worried about the property and, and their community. But I was never able to locate any evidence that she actually saw his uh, ship arriving. Um, I think it's, it's fair to, to speculate that there is a possibility that she would have been in uh, San Francisco to, to see the Joe come in with, with Amundsen on board. Uh, she certainly, it would have been the talk of the town. It would have been in all the newspapers. And because she herself had a very keen interest in polar exploration, it's likely she would have been uh, in San Francisco when the ship came in, but um, I, I've, I have found no, no proof that, sh that she was there to see the ship come in and, and certainly no proof whatsoever that she actually met Amundsen. To speak to your, your second question, um, yes, what, what is a, a, a marvelous thing about the work that she conducted was that uh, today many glaciologists, for example, there, there are several I've been in contact with in Norway who have used her existing um, uh, very detailed photographs of uh, glaciers in East Greenland to, um, to use that historic photography in their work to document glacial recession. So that is something that she, um, that, you know, her work continues to contribute and, and be relevant today. Great, thank you. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, Camilla, would you come on and ask your question? Yes, <clears throat> thank you. I'm just going to unmute myself. So yes, I have two questions. Um, Khalil uh, Louise Arnett Boyd um, was driven by her enormous passion, mm -hmm. which proper helped uh, her to take part even in this dangerous expeditions, uh, which were, um, so to me, I, I, that's the question. It were, still looks like a pleasure trip be, uh, funded by her. So my question is how much do you think she would be able to um, achieve uh, without this um, enormous financial backup, this uh, in inheritance? Um, and the second question is, it is known she was, okay, some kind of also celebrity. Um, and it is documented that she shot herself um, probably more than 10 polar bears. I can check in. So um, it was some in an expedition that, um, a number of polar bears were killed in a, in a matter of hours. So can you comment on that and perhaps give us some more insight to that, if possible? Yes, Thanks. yes, thank, thank you, Camilla. Thank you for your questions also. Uh, to speak to the first part, that, that, that's something that, that has come up um, many times because it's, you know, it's easy to say, well, you know, she, she had this, this huge fortune, she could do whatever she wanted. Uh, and so that's the reason that, that she accomplished what she did. But I, I think it, it's, it's really imperative to consider the time period that she lived in, the class that she came in, uh, that, she, that she was part of, uh, you know, and she was raised by her parents to be a, you know, to, to, to be a socialite and to get married, to have children and to be a, a, a functioning member of, of that California society. Um, you know, for a woman of that time period, for a woman in the, in, the, in the 1920s to decide, no, that she was not going to be a part of that as her, 
uh, you know, as the fulfillment of her life, but instead she was going to choose a vocation that was male dominant, uh, male dominated, that was completely contrary to, to this type of life as a socialite um, is a decision that, that was um, apart from anything to do with, with her money. Uh, she, she was being uh, completely unconventional and, and in my mind that didn't have anything to do with her fortune. Uh, that being said, it, it did allow her uh, tremendous freedom to follow that passion. And, and certainly the fortune gave her more options in life. Um, uh, something else that it provided her as an explorer, something different than other of her peers, her male peers did not have, is that because she had the money, she was able to finance the trip herself, determine what the objectives were, and she was not beholden to any organization. Uh, was not uh, was not necessary for her to find sponsors. So, for example, if you look at uh, you know uh, Bird or Peary or Shackleton or Scott or or any of the other major uh, male explorers in history, the vast majority of them had to. Uh, you know, go and, and, and seek financing elsewhere. And the need to be responsible to another organization or another company meant you had to adjust and revise your, um, your objectives. Uh, Miss Boyd didn't have to do that. So uh, I think her fortune allowed her to conduct her, her uh, scientific expeditions in a way that she saw fit. To, to speak to your second question, um, certainly that is true. The 1926 trip, uh, which was the last trip that was, was what you could call a, a pleasure trip or a tourist trip, was essentially a hunting cruise. Um, and, and, you know, my, my book alludes to this and it's, it's a difficult chapter. It was actually difficult for me to, to write that because uh, she, she enjoyed hunting and, and she did not just kill 10, 10 polar bears. She killed 10 times that, that number. She, she enjoyed it greatly. Uh, and, and from our perspective, our modern day perspective, where we're, we're very uh, aware of the uh, plight of the polar bear, we're very conscious of, of conservation. Um, you know, it's, it's easy to be um, critical of, of that behavior. But again, we have to consider the time period, uh, consider the fact that uh, uh, during that era, era uh, wealthy people who would travel to exotic locations would regularly take part in, in hunting. And uh, Miss Boyd was, was no different. I, I think the thing that, um, you know, that I was really delighted with uh, as her biographer is to, to learn that in between 1926 and, and 1928, her, her uh, perspective on this changed. Um, unlike again, many of the other uh, male explorers or, or, or other men going to, to areas like that. Still 1928 in other parts of the world, lots of um, significant hunting was going on. Uh, but by 1928 and for all her future expeditions, uh, there was no hunting that took place and, and it was uh, wholly focused on, on uh, scientific work. Thank you, Camilla. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, our next question is for Anna and it comes from Jean. Uh, are there contributions of women to polar activity taught in Russia as part of the normal history and study of this region currently? Was it difficult for you to learn about them? Um, thank you for a question. And um, if you consider normal history, it's like everyday history which students learn in the university and kids learn in school. Um, it is not uh, because it's not so popular and not so important comparing with wars and reforms. Uh, but I'm living in the Arctic zone. Uh, and of course, here this topic is quite popular and there is a lot of researchers in Northern Arctic Federal University who are focused on uh, this topic. But at the same time, I can say that a lot of resources, um, primary resources on this topic is still close to public. And for instance, I talk in my presentation about one linguistic, um, Rktoba, and one of her books was published just two years ago and uh, it was in archives and was close to the site. So it's a big field. There is a lot of literature on different aspects, but there is still enough space to research. 
Thank you. Uh, we have another question for you uh, from Volker that asks, large parts of the Russian Arctic were developed in Soviet era through forced labor in the Gulag system. What was the role of women in this system? Were there also women in Gulag camps in the Arctic? Unfortunately, I can't give a clear answer on this question, uh, but it's a really interesting topic to research. Uh, I know that uh, in general, um, prisoners of Gulag system were involved in Arctic exploration, especially in uh, mining. And I know that one of the, through one of the mining of gold passed more than uh, 900,000 people. So there was a really, really great number of people who passed through the system. Uh, but as, as for me, I think that women do not participate in it because condition was too hard and death rate might be too high and it was not possible to government to waste this power in such a way. But it's only my guess, so I can't be sure. Thank you. Um, our next question comes from Pauline and this is for Joanna. How long did Louise Boyd's expeditions last? Was language a barrier? Um, and was she the only female on these expeditions? Thank you, Pauline, for those questions. Um, I would say uh, that the majority of the expeditions lasted a number of months uh, because they were going in the Arctic. We, they had to take advantage of um, the weather, good weather conditions and the ice conditions. So generally it would last uh, between uh, one and two months or two and a half months, depending on, on um, the weather. Uh, in terms of the language, it, that, that was often a challenge in her uh, 1930s expeditions where she had a, a Norwegian captain and Norwegian crew. Um, the scientists that she worked with were, were always American or the majority of them were American. Uh, and she did, not know, she did not know Norwegian, but she had a very large Norwegian dictionary with her. And over time, she found that she was able to communicate uh, she, she learned a little Norwegian, they learned a little English, and, and they communicated that way. And uh, the last question, was she the only woman? Again, it varied according to the expedition. So um, in, in 1928, there was one other woman there who was a friend who accompanied her. Um, 31, there was a wife of one of the scientists who uh, essentially um, kind of elbowed her, her way onto the ship. Um, although Miss, Miss Boyd was, was in opposition to that. But in her last trips, the, the 33, 37, 38, and 41, uh, she was the only one because by that time she had learned that she really needed to uh, rule the roost herself. She didn't, she didn't want any other woman, women there. Uh, although she was a pioneer herself, she actually was not a, a feminist to my great chagrin. Um, uh, so she, she didn't welcome the, uh, the presence of women on her ships. Interesting, thank you. Um, I'm going to ask Peta, would you like to come on and ask your question next? Uh, it's Peter. Anna, it was wonderful to hear so much about the early female Russian and Soviet explorers and workers in the Arctic, but does the post-Soviet era continue to fund Arctic exploration by mixed or solo female gendered groups? Uh, could you repeat, please? The question that at the end, does the post-Soviet era continue to fund Arctic exploration by mixed or solo female gendered groups? Um, I'm, you're, you're speaking about modern history. I mean, that was going on now, right? Uh, so in this case, I suppose that Yes, because for instance, Arctic Floating University is an event which is held almost every year and there's a lot of participants of, of both genders. And uh, I suppose, yes, but my research was uh, ended by the mid 30s because uh, at that time, the Arctic as a reason changed. Um, the thing is that before 
the late 13th, it was considered as an economic area and it was open for researchers. But uh, in the late 13th, they started to be a military region, more much, much more closed. And it also um, affect on resources, which we can gain um, about it. So I finished my research on that front point. So I can't be really sure for what happens next. Thanks. Thank you. Um, so we have about 10 minutes left. I see only one other question in our chat box, but if you have others, now is the time to not be shy and ask those questions and put them in the chat. Um, the question we have is for both of our speakers and it's from an early career researcher. Um, and she asks, it's sometimes hard to find ways into uh, into researching women in polar history and being a woman researcher today. Do you have advice for someone who is starting their career in polar history to research women and to be a leader in polar histories? I can go first. Um, I would say, first of all, if this is your passion, then, then you need to pursue it absolutely. There may be some obstacles, but that is, um, you know, you, you need to continue because this is an important field and I would strongly urge you to, to do that. Uh, in terms of practical advice, I would say one thing that's of, of real importance is to uh, network to get involved with organizations that um, uh, work do work conduct research in in polar uh, polar history or polar research. Uh, so look on everything on so uh, on social media that would might be appropriate, whether it's on uh, you know LinkedIn or look on Facebook. Um, you want to join groups like uh, like for example Society of Women Geographers if that's appropriate to your field. Uh, look into various uh, Arctic organizations, whether it's uh, International Arctic Social Sciences Association, uh, for example. So to, to do research on what groups are available that you can join and then uh, network as much as possible. Meet these women, learn what they're writing about and reading and, and look for opportunities because um, there are certainly lots of opportunities for uh, early, early career scientists in, in this area. Uh, something else I would suggest is to um, publish as much as you can, and it doesn't have to be, you know, large publications based on uh, uh, extensive field work. It could just be uh, book reviews or short essays, but identify the journals, you know, whether it's Arctic or um, a polar record, whatever those um, uh, publications are, and, and start small but start to get your name out there and get to get other people to, to learn about who you are. And, um, and, and you'll find that, that this, this world, this field is, is actually quite small. And um, you know, after a few months, you'll find that, that your uh, efforts are, are paying off. Good luck. Anna, did you have anything else to offer? Um, yeah, and being a first master degree student, I can add a lot, but <laughs> my main advice is just to find a good supervisor with whom you will be able to build mutual understanding. And I think that is a 30% of success. That from both of you is excellent advice. Um, so I am jotting down notes for myself uh, to make sure that I am following that too. Um, so I think that is all of our questions today. So I'm going to again ask everyone to join me in giving a huge, huge virtual round of applause. Thank you so, so much, Joanna, Anna, for giving us your expertise, your time sharing, not just your research, but your passion for illuminating women's histories in the Arctic. I know that I really enjoyed this past hour and a half, and I'm sure all of our audience members did too. I am already seeing some great comments in the chat. As a reminder, this is part 
part of the Breaking the Ice Ceiling webinar series that is happening throughout 2021 through the spring, summer, and fall. And I encourage you to please join us at our next Breaking the Ice Ceiling event that you will find in our follow-up email. Uh, we will be talking about Indigenous perspectives on microbial research and addressing missing women data gaps on April 7th. So please, I look forward to joining all of you right back here on Zoom next month. Until then, I hope you all have a wonderful spring, have enjoyed our time together, and are taking away